Welcome to Vonde Radio. Today it is a great privilege to be joined by the first priest to join me on Vonde Radio. It is a great honor to be joined by Father Thomas Crean. Father Crean is a friar of the English province of the Order of Preachers. He is published with Ignatius Press and Grace Wing and is a fellow of the Dialogos Institute. He has taught philosophy and theology in Austria, the United States, and Northern Ireland. Father Thomas Crean, welcome to Vonde Radio. Thank you very much. Well, your work, uh, Father Crean, has um, really done good, I believe, through the, the publication of your work co-authored with Dr. Alan Fimister, entitled Integralism, a Manual of Political Philosophy. And I think it's actually quite an important work because it is, it is a scholarly manual, uh, a systematic account of philosophical concepts um, with solid uh, sourcing and presentation of the teaching of the teaching and exegesis from the fathers, from the doctors, the magisterium, and really represents a capitalization of the apostolate of the laity about which there is some confusion today. So, Father Crean, could you perhaps sort of situate your work in um, our contemporary times, its importance, its objectives, and, um, and how you see it being a tool for the laity to build Christendom? Thank you. Well, that's a big question. Um, there are various ways I could approach that. Perhaps the, the simplest way would be to explain what motivated uh, the two of us to write that book. Uh, and at least as far as I was concerned, there were two main motivations. One was more general, the other more particular. The more general one was a desire to provide something for students, especially Catholic students or students who are interested in in the church and in the tradition of Catholic thought that would summarize political philosophy, that would explain um, what political philosophy is and that would avoid the, um, the enlightenment ways of thinking, the secular ways of thinking which tend to dominate that subject. Um, so that would give them the tools with which they could then grapple with authors like Hobbes and Locke and, and Rousseau and modern uh, political philosophers as well. So that was, that was one motivation. Another motivation, particular interest of mine for several years has been the whole question of um, religious freedom and the sense in which the, the society should be Catholic. And uh, that's an interest of mine because it's uh, a divisive issue uh, in the church, as you know, and it's divisive, or at least it's controversial, even among those, perhaps especially among those who, who genu genuinely desire to be faithful to the, the church and to, to divine revelation. But it's a very disputed question. And it seemed to me that there were a lot of very interesting, um, a lot of very interesting works uh, that had been done on this question, which had various important things to say, but they hadn't really all been brought together. So perhaps in a slightly presumptuous way, what my co-author and I were hoping to do uh, as regards that subject was to, to provide a synthesis of the church's teachings um, on this question. Perhaps we'll get onto this a bit later on uh, and show how document like Dignitatis Humanae of the 1960s about religious liberty, how that should be read in continuity with the whole tradition of the church and the fathers and doctors of the church. So from my, from my um, point of view, at least, those are the two, two main motivations. Yes. Um, as you know, Aristotle said, what is last in execution is first in intention. And a friend of mine went to a, in a conference on evangelization. There is a bit of an evangelization moment in the church or certainly a sort of trend of talking about it the the actual definition is 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 rather vague and the, the purpose of, of to actually save souls is sort of studiously omitted 
but he he asked one of the the speakers there, who's a big figure in this movement, uh, Sherry Waddell, who wrote a book on, called Missionary Disciples, and her work has received a lot of exposure from the hierarchy and sort of presented to diocese as um, something of a of an answer to the the problem of the apostasy of the nations. And he asked this this lady, Sherry Waddell. So, so what is the objective of, of, of our missionary discipleship? Are we trying to rebuild Christendom? He just asked her explicitly. And, and she said, well, no, it's, um, we're trying to offer an invitation to friendship with Jesus Christ. But really, this uh, liberal, pluralistic society is something desirable and, and sort of gave this very waffly answer. So I, I think your, your work strikes me as a, as a very helpful antidote to that kind of error. And I particularly appreciate its educational value, seeing as you have the synopsis of the theses expounded in the chapter at the end of each chapter, which... Uh... Yes, I think, well, just to take up that point about the um, uh, liberalism and so on, I, I think that is part of our historical uh, moment today, is that more and more Catholics are really beginning to think that that's not actually um, adequate. And in that sense, the the mask is being uh, is being torn off more and more from the uh, the liberal so supposedly neutral um state of course I was back in the 19th century uh leo the 13th saw it very clearly and he said uh, a society which claims to be uh, neutral is in fact uh in practice atheistic mm. uh, and he was a prophet in that regard and um i, I imagine lots of catholics uh, at the time thought him thought that he was exaggerating or maybe they thought oh that's just the kind of things popes have to say but uh, you know, the course of the decades especially the last few, last few years I think is proving him more and more correct uh, and I think more and more Catholics are beginning to see that the so-called neutral state is uh, is not their friend mm. and if it was for a while that was uh, for a certain complex uh, combination of historical causes, but in the nature of things, it's not their friend. Uh, and I think more and more Catholics are beginning to realize that um, for the church to be free requires society to be Catholic, requires the, the favor of the law. And that's not just a, um, an optional extra, but that is uh, necessary. For the mission of the church so so i think there in that sense um our book um was an also an attempt to crystallize we could say uh a feeling that's, that's in the air uh, mm. which i think is going to become even stronger as as the years go by yes in fact i, I see it almost ex accelerating actually and as you say the time where there was some sort of approximation of natural law instantiated in the polity of let's say western nations and gave an appearance of promoting the common good was just an appearance because there was no establishment of political in the political community of the public worship of god according to how he wills to be worshipped and therefore leaving the citizens of that society unprepared for their their supernatural end Yes, and, and more generally, you could, use, you could use the image of a car, uh, a car that's built up speed. Uh, if, it, if the engine cuts out, uh, um, the car is going to um, uh, continue on, under, its own, under its own momentum for a certain uh, some period of time. Um, but it's not going to be here to, uh, to recover uh, as the engine's put back on again. And I think that's a fairly good analogy for... Um, this post uh, Reformation and post French revolutionary societies, the the Christian capital that had been built up over the centuries was not dissipated in a, in a, in a moment, uh, and particularly the idea of families as stable and marriage as indissoluble um, remained part of the the heritage and the lived experience of most people for a long time, uh, and that allowed people to have the illusion that it was possible to build a society just on natural law uh, without uh, that divine grace uh, but i think that, that was just an illusion yes and as you yes, say yes. the manual omitting the 
the first precept of the natural law, which is to to know God and seek to serve him as he desires, which is through the Catholic religion. And talking of the family, you, you have a chapter very fittingly early on in your, your book on the family, and it's, it's place as the, the conglomeration of families, uh, forming communities, uh, then forming regions or provinces, and then, and then forming nations. I mean, you provide a pretty effective uh, refutation of the, the myth of the Rousseauian social contract. Would, would you mind sort of perhaps uh, explaining that a little bit uh, for our listeners? Oh yes. Um, so I think the the key thing to understand about what you call Aristotelian uh, Thomist political philosophy, or just perennial political philosophy, is the fact that the family, uh, the, the society, and not just the family, but um, civil society, is uh, is a natural reality. Um, so in that sense, um, it's something more like a human being or like a, a plant, like an apple or, or a tree, rather than like an artifact, rather than like something like that human beings design, uh, like a computer or a toaster, something like that. Um, and what that means is that there is, um, there is such a thing as a, uh, a good society and such a thing as a bad society that's um, determined independently of human wills. So the, so the, the Rousseauian view, that, which is a uh, social contract view, which is basically the alternative to Aristotelianism, which comes in lots of other forms. It's not just Rousseau, you get it in, in Hobbes, but also in, in modern political philosophers of, of different uh, kinds, like Rawls and Nozick. It's the idea that the human society is whatever we want it, want, to be, want it to be. It's an artifact, and we can design it as we wish it to be. Um, so uh, there's no objective criterion of whether a society is good or bad. Uh, it's, just, um, uh, it's just whether it corresponds to the, the wills of the people who are designing it uh, is the only way in which one can assess it. Um, Whereas the, the Thomist view and the Catholic view is that uh, human beings have an end, a goal which is not their, something they can just decide, but which is something which is assigned them by God, uh, and that by virtue of their natures, they belong to society. Uh, they don't get to choose to create an authority over them. So human, social authority is not the result of uh, autonomous people getting together and saying uh, life would be more convenient if somebody was in charge. No, from the very fact of being born um, as a human being subject to natural law, you are subject to the authorities uh, that are in place. This is um, what we mean by saying that authority comes from God. It's, it's from nature that we belong to a society and that we're subject to the rulers of that society. Uh, whether they're hereditary rulers or whether they are elected rulers uh, makes no difference. The fact is that um, uh, to belong to a society uh, is part of um, natural law uh, and the goal of that society is given by God. Um, and so for to get, to get a, a concrete example, for example, um, human beings can't decide that in their society uh, marriage will be uh, a soluble contract. It will be a contract that can be terminated uh, on either side, um, or they can't decide that um, uh, in their society um, there will be no property rights, uh, and that um, uh, all property must be um, uh, the the possession of the state, uh, because those those things are contrary to the end for which society exists. Uh, and that end for which society exists is not uh, determined by the free choice of human beings. It's something that's written into human nature by the creator. Um, so that's rather an abstract uh, answer, but maybe, that, maybe that's the first approximation to the difference between the social contract theory and the, the natural law account of, of society and authority.
No, thank you very much. I'm sure you're familiar with the work of your fellow English Dominican, Father Aidan Nichols, The Realm, an essay on mm -hmm. the evangelization of, of England. And in that work, which I highly recommend, he presents quite a beautiful account of, you say, the natural law origin of, of nations. With regard to England, he talks about a social covenant, about how specifically King Alfred the Great, as father of his people, promulgated Lex, law, um, in return for fidelity, and really conceptualizes this as, I say, a covenant rather than a contract. And I think that's an important difference. Social covenants. So this is the idea that there's a, a sacred duty of the, the king to serve his people and of the, uh, the people to uh, obey their king as the representative of, of Christ. Is that the... Exactly, the yes. So it's the, sa the sacralization of kingship. Mm -hmm write and speak very eloquently about the uh, onset of modernity, the, the dissolution of Christendom, the attack on divine revelation as principal public law and public policy. But I always find it more, more encouraging to read about the building of Christendom and the, the establishment of divine revelation as the principal public law and public policy. And you see a pattern in these first Christian nations of seeing the nation as a type of, of Israel, you know, adopting the divine law yes so the, the sacralization of 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 rulers is uh i think a important theme in in, in christendom um and people often raise the question of whether whether kingship is an essential part of christendom and people often assume that it is and, and one of the arguments that's often put forward for thinking that is that, is that there are a lot of canonized and beatified kings. Um, obviously, there are lots of kings who are, are not canonized and indeed not canonizable, but nevertheless, there are plenty of canonized uh, kings. And people say, well, there are no canonized uh, presidents. Um, mm. and, and then other people say, well, maybe that's just. Uh, Maybe that's just a coincidence, or maybe uh, maybe it's just that the the revolutionaries um, um, uh, who were hostile to to Christendom uh, were naturally hostile to all established authorities, and therefore they they were inclined to overthrow monarchies and replace them with with presidents and so on. It seems to me that uh, while heredit hereditary hereditary rule is um we, we we talk about this in the book of course we mentioned the advantages and disadvantages of her hereditary rule um seems to me that that's less connatural to christendom than than sacral rule uh so as you know the the holy roman emperors themselves were for a long part of the history not uh, not hereditary monarchy even though they were the principal monarchy of christendom they were an elective monarchy um but um, to be to be uh, consecrated as the ruler, whether or not you're you're ruler by dint of birth, or whether or not you're a, uh, an elected ruler, um, does seem to be uh, essential, or at least uh, extremely desirable, for uh, for the life of Christendom, um, as it's a sort of permanent reminder of of the fact that. Uh, the authority of the ruler is from God, and that his highest author his highest uh, duty not his not necessarily the one that occupies most of his time but his highest duty is to aid the the church in the preaching of the gospel and the defense of the faith um, so I do think that um, uh, sacral authority is uh, is connatural to christendom um, mm. And that it's not, in that sense, it's not just a coincidence that there have been uh, a higher proportion of uh, canonized uh, kings and of canonized presidents. Your chapter on the forms of polity I found to be very elucidating in this regard. And I, I wonder what, how you might respond to, as you say, there is a, a coincidence between the overthrow of 
of monarchy in Europe and the attack on the divine revelation as a principle of public policy and public law. Those two things do seem to occur in the same time frame and as part of the same diabolical revolutionary attack. And then writers, uh, Catholic counter-revolutionary writers like uh, Dr. Plinio Croa de Oliveira have written about the monarchic principle in the universe, about how there is a metaphysical principle that's not just a merely political principle, but the fact that heaven is a court, heaven is a monarchy, the family is a monarchy, the church is a monarchy, and therefore it is fitting that there is an adequation between that and the the forms of uh, the form of political government that where things are gathered together of the same order by natural affinity whether that's mineral botanical human angelic or by conventional affinity men who gather for a certain pursuit or club the tendency of those gathered beings is to fit in around a principal being that places them in order vitalizes their characteristics and directs them to their end. Take, for example, an artistic ensemble or a choir. A choir is made up of people of unequal musical qualities. Those with greater musical qualities support the mediocrity of others participating in the musicality of the choir. And there is a principle of St. Thomas that says, similis simile gaudet, the similar rejoices in its counterpart. This is to say that a similar being thrives in contact with its similar is toned in contact with its similar with its similar so there is this this kind of monarchical principle as an expression of the unitary principle of the universe and i'm sure you know uh, honor de balzac said that when the king uh, when the revolutionaries cut off the head of the king they cut off the heads of all the fathers in the country oh i didn't know that phrase that's that's very profound yes Yes, well, it sort of strikes me that in the American Revolution, in a sense, was a kind of patricide. It was it was a a revolt against against a father, and I don't think it's a coincidence that the the revolutionary ideology of movement of feminism arose in America. Yes, so as we talk about in the in the book, um, Saint Thomas uh, has, as you know, has the has the work on on the kingship. Uh, De Regno, um, in which he puts forward, forward various uh, arguments for the um, the superiority of, of what he calls monarchia, or, or, or the rule of a rex. Um, it's not clear that he's ever thinking about hereditary monarchy. That's an interesting point that people often miss in that book. They just assume that mm. a, a king is is hereditary king, um, and he doesn't really. He doesn't really deal with that question in the De Regno. Um, so he's, he's very clear that um, uh, there needs to be a unifying principle. Uh, and I think you would agree that, um, well, in fact, he, he says as much uh, that it's a reflection of the divine rule in, in the universe. Um, uh, I don't think he makes the, the analogy with the Father quite so much, but he certainly thinks it's a reflection of the divine rule in the universe. Um, but in itself, that's independent of the question of, of heredity. Uh, and as I say, I think, I think there are good arguments on both sides, but it is a fact that normally it seems to tend that way. And I think that, I think that's uh, a suggestion that, um, that there's something that which is, which is in accordance with nature, something which is agreeable to human beings uh, and not in a selfish way, because it's not, it's not obvious what, um, it's not obvious that having a hereditary monarchy is uh, um, flattering to the uh, the egos of the citizens. It doesn't seem to be some kind of uh, selfish motivation. Um, uh, so it does seem to me that there is something which is, is deeply in accord with nature uh, about the hereditary her, hereditary principle. Uh, so I wanted to ask your thoughts about a common sort of error that I think Catholic, Orthodox Catholics, Catholic traditionists fall into, which is to uh, really exalt what you could call national Catholicism or a sort of positive Catholicism, as uh, Charles Murat framed it, and to really see 
you know, Franco Spain or even further back, Louis the Fourteenth France, Gallicanism, Josephism, these these confessional states, though of course Franco Spain wasn't formally confessional, but to see them as the objective rather than to uh, and I think what you do in your book is it's helpfully explain how these states, although they didn't deny the the truth of the Catholic religion, nevertheless the temporal order usurped the spiritual order to a, a lesser or greater extent. Yes, and this is always the temptation, I think, for for um, human beings. It's sort of the the social reflection of of what Saint Paul talks about when he talks about the war between the flesh and the spirit and obviously both the the flesh in the sense of the body uh, and the spirit in the sense of um, the human soul as transfigured by grace they're both good things uh, but because we are uh, animals and we get all our knowledge from the senses it's very difficult for people to live according to the spirit and mm. there's a constant downward tendency by the body, even though the body in itself is good, there's a constant downward tendency, a tendency to um, make our center of attention this world. Uh, and that constantly has to be resisted. So that's why uh, conversion is a daily necessity in the, in the Christian life. And it seems to me this, exactly the same thing goes on socially. So even in a, even in a Catholic country, uh, there's going to be a constant temptation for the rulers to make the, the temporal good, the, the visible good of their country, their primary concern and temptation to see the church uh, as, um, as useful, as a useful means of, of, a, of attaining that. Um, so sub to subordinate the kingdom of God to, uh, to life on earth. Uh, and um, you know, that, that has to be resisted. So uh, mm. there's need need for a constant conversion of, of rulers, uh, not only qua Christians, but also qua rulers. Um, so I suppose in, in so far as we present any ideal, uh, obviously all, all, all historical periods are flawed because they, they are uh, the work of flawed human beings. But in so far as we present any human, human period as, as an ideal, it's not going to be um, uh, Louis the Fourteenth or uh, um, let alone anyone in the 20th century, but uh, the high Middle Ages and, and Innocent the Third, um, sort of bringing to fruition what was um, already implied by the coronation of Charlemagne in 800 by uh, uh, by Pope Leo. Um, so that coronation of of Charlemagne by the Pope. The reason why it's so uh, famous in history is that it's a perfect symbol of the the superiority of of grace over nature, of the spiritual, of the temporal. Um, and it took a long while for all the implications to be to be worked out. And almost as soon as they were worked out, uh, that synthesis began to dissolve. But um, with someone like Innocent III, I think we, we see the, um, uh, the theoretical synthesis there and also the, uh, the practical uh, lived reality of that, and of the, the Pope recognized as as truly the ruler of Christendom, uh, and, that, and that's obviously very difficult for any any earthly temporal ruler to to um, to sort of uh, admit in a in a in a deep way, because then it, one of the dangers of human power is that it's liable to provoke uh, pride in fallen human men, and so it's liable to make them want to resist. Uh, 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 the superiority of the spiritual power, but um, uh, they have to. Yes, there's a very elucidating chapter in your book on the two swords. And I wonder if you could just explain that a little bit for our listeners and also how there is a place for the, the temporal power to correct the spiritual power when it, when it errs. I'm thinking of Henry II, the Holy Roman Emperor, actually coming to restore the papacy uh, after the corruption of the pornocracy of the the 10th century into the 11th century how he actually overthrew the pope i, I can't remember the name pope benedict i believe put the the, the strength of the temporal power behind a more uh, virtuous pope 
Yeah. So, what was the first part of that of that question? Uh, so, on the on the two swords. Yes. And and oh, how I mean, what, and, and what that phrase means, or yes, and the exegesis from the Gospel of Luke, and right. um, and how that then also is linked by uh, the mellifluous Doctor Saint Bernard of Clairvaux to Saint Peter's drawing of the sword in the the Garden of Gethsemane. Yes. So it refers to that that passage in St. Luke's Gospel at the Last Supper, when um, our Lord draws a distinction between two phases in the disciples' experience. Uh, and he says to them, when I sent you out uh, without cloak or purse, so without any temporal resources, did you laugh? But then he, and then he says, but now I say to you, um, let him who has a cloak uh, sell it um, and uh, and acquire a sword. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, and they said to him, Lord, here are two swords. And he says to them, it is enough. And that's an extremely mysterious uh, passage in the gospel, which as far as I can see for a first few hundred years, it really the first millennium of the church's history, the, the fathers and doctors didn't really know what to make of it. And from about the time of um, St. Peter Damien, and then especially St. Bernard onwards, it comes to be generally accepted that this, these two swords are a reference to the, the spiritual and the temporal power as being two uh, powers which are existing within the church for... Um, the mission of the church in the broad sense um, and the, the distinction that our lord makes between the two epochs in a disciple's experience and so that first epoch when they, he sent them out without temporal means and this new epoch when he's equipping them with temporal means you know, par excellence uh, you know, swords uh, even though they're, they're not going to use them i'll come back to that in a moment that that comes to be seen by St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, as reflecting the life of the church herself. And that in the life of the church, there is a first period, which is a period under persecution, which corresponds to the time in the, church, in the, in the disciples' training when they were sent out without temporal resources. And it's important that there was that period of the church's life, because the, fact, the very fact that the church grew under persecution is itself a very important sign of uh, of her divine mission, the fact that God was, was with her. Um, but then after the conversion of uh, the Roman emperors, especially after the conversion of um, Theodosius, not, not his conversion, but after his uh, becoming the emperor, uh, at the end of the fourth century, uh, the church begins to acquire uh, temporal resources in the sense that temporal rulers from the Roman Emperor downwards become Catholic and they aid the church in her mission. And this is not seen by the popes or by the saints uh, as a bad thing. It's not seen as a betrayal of the gospel or as a hindrance. It's seen as part of the divine, uh, divine providence that after the time of persecution, uh, a time of, of even temporal flourishing uh, is taking place. But what the, the later doctors in, the, in the, um, the church's history from St. Bernard onwards argue is that the two swords are, belong to the church, but not in the same sense. Um, so the church, of course, is not just the, the clergy. The church is the whole body of the faithful clergy and laity together. Uh, and the spiritual power is the the power of the Pope and the bishops. Uh, so that corresponds to one of the swords. Uh, the temporal power is the power of, um, of, of kings, prime ministers, presidents, and so on. It's uh, the other sword. Uh, and that belongs to the church really in two senses. One in the sense that ideally these people are Catholics. So the kings and the prime ministers and the judges are, are Catholics and they're going to use their um, their authority justly, and they get to use it ultimately to help with the mission of the church and the salvation of souls. Uh, 
there's also another sense in which this temporal sword uh, belongs to the church. And this is the point that St. Bernard makes. Um, that in, the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when St. Peter strikes the ear from the, um, the head of the high priest's servant, uh, our Lord says to him, put thy, put thy sword back into thy scabbard, or back into its sheath. Um, St. Bernard says, so even this sword is St. Peter's, because Christ says to him, put thy sword back into thy scabbard, and yet St. Peter is not allowed to use it. You might say, and you might say well, that's a bit pointless, isn't it? Having a sword that you're not allowed to use. But St. Bernard's argument, which comes to be generally accepted by the later doctors, is that the Pope and the bishops are not allowed to make use of temporal power normally. Then They shouldn't be running uh, nations, with, you know, with a slight exception of the fact that the, the Pope has uh, a region in central Italy which he does run as political ruler, but that's just a kind of anomaly that's necessary for his, his freedom. But normally the Pope and the bishops are not meant to be acting as temporal rulers. But the sword, temporal sword, still belongs to them in the sense that they can call upon um, Catholic rulers to use their political power for the needs of the church uh, in, in grave need. Uh, for example, to, uh, to check a heresy that threatens to destroy the faith in some province of Christendom. Uh, and again, in a grave, really grave situation where the, the temporal ruler is, is refusing to do that, then the, the Pope can, or the Pope has the authority um, to declare that temporal ruler to have fallen from his, his, his post and to, to give that temporal authority to somebody else. And that's obviously not something he can do just because he feels like it, but only if there's a grave, a grave spiritual need. Um, but... Also, to get back to the, the other part of your question, yes, the, uh, the temporal rulers, even though in that sense they should be the instruments of the church for spiritual ends, they are not meant to be like mere children or merely passive in the face of spiritual authority. Uh, and they can themselves uh, discern, they have the right to discern if a spiritual authority, a pope or a bishop, is not doing their, their job correctly. Uh, now, I don't think that they've ever got the right uh, to depose a pope. I know there's controversial questions in, in history, and one could discuss the facts about exactly what happened, who had the right to do what. I don't think they have the right, have the right to depose a pope, but I think they can certainly you justly use their authority to make life difficult for a bad pope. For example, they can... Uh, um, withhold uh, the subsidies that are being given, normally given to support Catholic institutions, seminaries and, uh, and cathedrals and universities and, and so on. So they, they're, not, they're not resourceless uh, in the face of, of bad popes. And obviously, like anybody else, they certainly don't have to execute uh, orders when uh, a pope or a bishop is uh, acting outside his sphere of authority. So and then the Pope or the Bishop doesn't have the right to tell rulers how to run their countries, uh, how much uh, tax to levy or you know, how to train their armies or where to build their roads or what percentage of immigrants to, uh, to let into the country or um, you know, whether there's a particular carbon threshold that they ought to be meeting for uh, uh, emissions of, of fuel or whatever. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a complex interrelation. Uh, doesn't lend itself to uh, brief sound bites. It lends, uh, it, there's a risk of caricaturing the doctrine of the two swords. But basically, what it is saying is that um, they should be working together, there should be a distinction between the two powers, uh, there should be a subordination between the two powers, uh, but that doesn't give the right to uh, a pope or a bishop just to, to boss. Uh, Boss, boss political uh, authority around. Thank you. So to move on to the sad repudiation or widespread repudiation of the, the kingship of, of Christ, the social kingship of Christ in our own time, as you're aware, the, the uh, controversy rages and 
generally speaking, traditional writers have identified the the declaration from the Second Vatican Council, Dignitatis Humanae, as the clearest example of error in that council. And it's a confusing document um, with the, the first sentence, obviously, famously uh, declaring that it leaves untouched the obligation of men to seek the truth, especially in what concerns God and his church and to embrace the truth. They come to know and hold fast to it. But then later in the document to say things such as this Vatican Synod declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. The Synod further declares that the right to religious freedom has its foundation, the very dignity of the human person, as this dignity is known through the revealed word of God and by reason itself. So I wonder if you could to bring some light to clear some of this confusion, perhaps some of our listeners might have. And also, you know, to be fair to the SSPX and you know, other critics of this document, uh, the church has never uh, sort of formally clarified some of this confusion. So it continues to rage. I mean, for example, in 2012, they submitted a series of propositions to for Pope Benedict to re- respond to, and he didn't. And I think this sort of gets into the actual history of the, the moment of Dignitatis Humanae, where, and certainly its reception has been heterodox, even if the text wasn't heterodox itself. Yes, so it's a big question. Um, we argue, um, we, we present in our, in our book uh, a continuity between Dignitatis Humanae and uh, traditional Catholic doctrine. So I, I, I don't believe there is uh, anything heretical or uh, heterodox in, in Dignitatis Humanae. In fact, I think it's, it is useful in... Um, in bringing to light a part of the, the synthesis that hadn't been previously brought to light. So I would make, make two points about it. One point is the point that's made, been made very much in recent, recent years by Thomas Pink, which is that it's about the rights of human beings uh, in regard to the civil power. So that's written into the constitution. It's about uh, religious liberty, uh, in civil matters, so vis-a-vis the, the political power. And that helps us to see how, in fact, uh, it does leave untouched um, the traditional, that, that's part of what helps us to see how it leaves untouched the traditional Catholic doctrine, because um, the traditional Catholic doctrine about the right of uh, authorities uh, to, let's say, restrain uh, the baptized from heresy uh, is not in the first place about a civil jurisdiction over the baptized. It's a reference to the, or depends on the jurisdiction which the church uh, as a true society, as a true perfect society, has over the baptized. So just as citizens are under the jurisdiction of the political powers. So a baptized person, every, any baptized person is under the jurisdiction of the church. And in the situation of Christendom, as we were just talking about with regard to the two swords, the church has the right uh, to call upon the, uh, the temporal power, what's traditionally called the secular arm, to, uh, to oblige the baptized people to fulfill their baptismal duties. Um, and that's what's going on. Um, at least that's one of the things that's going on in Christendom. Uh, so the, the church becomes aware that a certain uh, heresy is is raging or is threatening to spread among a group of the faithful. And obviously, church preaches uh, the Catholic truth uh, to call people back from from the heresy. When this isn't sufficient, then the church also uh, calls upon the, the secular power to step in and do something about it. Uh, and what that might be can depend on, on the circumstances, but this is already in place in St. Augustine's day, uh, that the, the secular power uh, is acting to prevent the spread of donatism, for example, by, by financial penalties. Um, and all that is left, is left untouched by Dignitatis Humanae, because Dignitatis Humanae is talking about what the 
what a secular civil power can do or what the civil power can do considered just as a civil power or just as a reality under natural law and abstracting from what he can do once it's, it's been brought into um, Christendom, once it's acting as an, as an instrument of the spiritual power. So Thomas Pink has made that case from the, uh, from the text of um, Dignitatis Simone and from looking at the, uh, the discussions of the, of the Vatican Council, how uh, the discussions went towards the making of that document, uh, and how they were very careful uh, to remain within um, to remain within the framework of natural law in describing the, um, the rights and duties of the civil power, so as not to um, put into question uh, those rights which they have as an instrument of the, of the spiritual power. So I think he's absolutely right to have done that, and that's that's one of the two things I would say that we need to understand to, to read the Intentis Money correctly and in continuity. Uh, the other thing is, um, again, a point we make in our book, which is that Dignitatis Humani itself says that political powers um, have the right, even without being asked to do this by, by the church, they've got the right to restrain uh, unworthy proselytism. Now, what people often think of when they, when they read that phrase is probably something like, um, what went on in, in Ireland in the 19th century when um, uh, British authorities uh, would sometimes try, during the famine, would try sometimes uh, try to get Catholics to apostatize by offering them, you know, offering them food. And uh, you know, taking the Irish talk about taking the soup as a, as a metaphor for apostasy or for becoming Protestants. Um, so that's one sense, one sort of obvious sense of unworthy proselytism, but it doesn't have to be as, as gross as that, because as Catholics, we can recognize that just any attempt to try to induce Catholics to leave their faith is intrinsically unworthy, because it's attempting to get them to uh, submit the word of God to to human to, yeah, to, to subject the word of God to human arguments uh, and to put human reason above uh, divine faith and you know as Catholics we can see that's an intrinsically unworthy uh, thing to do and so for that reason Catholic governments even under dignitatis money and even uh, in regard to non-baptized people can rightfully can rightly prevent them from uh, trying to persuade Catholics to apostatize. So, for example, uh, a Catholic country where there is a, uh, a Muslim minority, can the Muslims uh, go door to door and try to persuade Catholics to become Muslim? Well, under Dignitatis Money, I would say no. If the government recognizes Catholic religion as, as true, as it's got the right to do, and as desirably it should do, then they can recognize that kind of uh, proselytism as being unworthy. Uh, and so for that reason, they can, they can legitimately outlaw it. Uh, and so I, I think the, um, I think those two, those two points, Thomas Pink's point, uh, and then that second point about unworthy, pro unworthy proselytism, I think they basically cover everything that we would want to cover, everything that we would want to defend in the history of the church. Uh, I think that would satisfy the Society of St. Pius X as well. Uh, and I think it leaves Dignitatis Sumani intact. So the one thing that Dignitatis Sumani does do, which is, um, which is new in the sense of making explicit something which had not been made explicit uh, before, at least by the, uh, the highest levels of the church, was to say that unbaptized people um, have a right to uh, practice their own religion uh, if it's a monotheistic religion and to the extent that that doesn't um, threaten uh, the faith of Christians or of course public order. And I think that's true because without that, 
be a kind of coercion to accept baptism and as as you know coercion to baptism is has always been recognized as something which is illegitimate mm -hmm. so so i don't think the dignitatis humanae is just uh, uh, an embarrassing document that we have to try to explain away uh, i don't think it's always helpfully framed i think it's a partial mm -hmm. document incomplete document but i think it does have uh, um, that that part of the truth which uh, should be put together with the other uh, more important parts of the truth to provide a, a synthesis on the whole question what would you say to the retort that when dealing with a document accused or of ambiguity in a court of law an examination is made of the spirit of that document and the motivations of the authors and i think it's quite clear that there was a, a desire to sort of smuggle in christian humanism into the church's philosophy a kind of mauritanian mauritanian project and also a, an ideological desire on the part of father john courtney murray and the, the kind of americanist element to to basically harmonize catholicism with the principles of the american constitution and then you have just out and out modernists such as hans kung and bishop de smed of bruges eager to just change supposedly the church's teaching and, and these the characters are all behind framing tone of dignitas humanae in this very optimistic language which then leads to a reception uh, in a heterodox way which is obviously un deeply unhelpful yes the first principle that comes to mind is that um well, well the two principles that come to mind one is that church documents have to be read in continuity the second one is that they have to be read so that they're coherent so if you if you try to say that Dean Tati Sumani uh, breaks with past tradition, then you're immediately making it incoherent because it itself says it doesn't break with past tradition. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think that the attempt to make, I don't think that the heterodox reading is legitimate um, using following the principles of uh, interpretation of church documents. Um, another thing I would add is that you have to distinguish between doctrinal parts of the uh, Unitatis Humanae, so what it's, it's teaching, what it's saying the Catholics should believe, and, and I think uh, that the central part of it is actually taught infallibly, even though it's not taught as a dogma, it's not taught as something revealed, but I think, as you know, the church can teach infallibly on matters of natural law. I think that's what's going on in the central part of the Unitatis Humanae. One has to distinguish between those those doctrinal parts, uh, and then secondly, prudential judgments about what would work best today, uh, and then thirdly, um, what you might call social commentary. Uh, and we are not we should, though we should respectfully listen to those uh, second and third categories of statement. We're not obliged to give an assent to them. So, for example, when the document says that a sense of human dignity is growing more and more, spreading more among, among more among, among human beings today, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I don't think that the Vatican Council was saying that um, um, Catholics, if they want to be in good standing, must believe that a sense of human dignity is spreading more and more among human beings today. Um, on the, 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 on the Maritanian question, I think it's important to distinguish actually Marita, Maritan from Courtney Murray. And what, what you seem to find if you read the discussions behind this document is that at the beginning, Courtney Murray and the American bishops were quite influential, but they become less influential as the document gets revised and it gets revised more in a Maritanian direction. Now, Maritan though he was all in favor of, of not rebuilding Christendom, uh, except in what he called a, a secular Christendom. Um, mm. He didn't think it would be uh, contrary to Catholic doctrine to do so. Uh, and he perfectly accepted that the medieval Christendom was a legitimate thing. And he even, he even foresaw that sometime in, in the unknown future, such a Christendom could be legitimately revived. He just thought that in our time, 
it would be better for the church not to try to do it. Uh, and, I, and Paul VI, I'm th sure, agreed with him. Uh, and I think that opinion influences the tone of the document, but it doesn't um, make its way into the doctrinal section. I think influences what's not said in the doctrinal section, but I don't think that it's, um, I don't think that it's embedded in what is said in the doctrinal section. So in other words, I think one can perfectly accept the doctrine of Dignitati Sumane or disagreeing with the prudential judgment of, of Maritain and, and I think Paul VI about what was likely to work in our day. Yes, and if you look at the immediate aftermath of the Second Vatican Council, you have such events as the disestablishment of the Catholic religion in Colombia, uh, the referendum in Ireland in 1972, which removes the, the clause in the constitution, which I think identifies a position of respect for the Catholic religion as the religion of the majority, the vast majority of the Irish people, with the quiescence or even outright support of those countries' bishops. So, you know, nevertheless, even if dignitas humani can be seen in continuity, there is still the problem of a large part of the Catholic hierarchy dissenting from the church's tradition and the, the church's teaching on the temporal and spiritual orders. I think if you'd asked them, are you dissenting from the tradition? They would have said no. Uh, I think they, because these questions are complicated, I think they might not have been sure how what they were saying fitted in with the church's tradition. Um, but I think what was going on principally was a falling in line with the prudential judgment of Paul VI. Uh, and then the fact that he appointed bishops who, who agreed with him. Um, so I wouldn't myself say that there was a, a dissent from the doctrine of, I mean, obviously part of some people there was. I don't think one can say on the part of the hierarchy as a whole, it was a dissent from the doctrinal tradition of the church, but I think there was an agreement with a, a prudential judgment of Paul VI, which the, uh, they might not have realized that they were free not to agree with. Hmm. Yes, and Paul VI indeed sort of famously refused to use the charitable anathema in response to the mm -hmm. explosion of heresy in the wake of the council and such horrors as the the Dutch Catechism, the Winnipeg Statement in response to um, Humane Vitae, mm -hmm. and Dietrich von Hildebrand begged him to use this against these bodies of prelates that were publicly dissenting, and he would just cry and not do anything. And this is the, the destiny of perhaps millions of souls at stake, and it's, it's quite shocking to consider the, the lack of fatherliness from the Pope, time, and, and many of the bishops. Well, Paul VI, I think, was genuinely convinced by the, by the Maritanian approach. Uh, and he, he, I think he was genuinely, genuinely convinced that uh, if only people would fall behind him, then everything would work out well. And that uh, there would be a, uh, a flourishing or the faith in Catholic countries. Um, so, well, uh, uh, it didn't work out like that. Um, uh, what else can one say? Indeed. Well, I'd like to uh, give you a chance, uh, Father Cream, to respond to some of your critics and some of the, the responses that your, your work has, has generated. Sadly, the book itself was published, I believe, last summer. So during the whole COVID event, COVID episode, and I was going to go to the launch of the book, at least in Britain in the Brompton Oratory, and that was uh, cancelled, sadly. So the book, I don't think has had the sort of publicity that it deserves. So hopefully this interview will go a small way to contributing to that. But I suppose the first and most common criticism that I see in Catholic public square, if you will, is from Americans. And it comes from this kind of American pragmatism where the idea is, well, integralism is all very well and good, but it's so unlikely, it's so un impractical, we just need to forget about it for now. 
why even talk about something that's never going to happen? Yes, well, the various answers one could give to that. Um, one, one answer is um, uh, that a book of philosophy is a book of philosophy. Uh, it's not the same as thing as a political manifesto for the next by-election. Uh, and that um, uh, the human beings, part of the perfection of human beings is uh, to understand the, uh, the truth of things. Uh, and even when it's not possible to put it into practice, it's still a desirable uh, way to live, is to, to think about the truth of things. Um, so that's, that's one answer. A second answer, what we've already touched on, is that the, um, the last in, uh, in execution is the first in intention. So to engage in political uh, activity of any kind, uh, you've got to have a goal. Uh, and if you can have a goal, well, why not make it the right goal rather than the wrong goal? Or uh, a partly wrong goal. The third answer I would give is that I would retort uh, that particular criticism about unreality. So this is something that um, certain uh, certain American commentators have have said that uh, uh, people talk, talk about integralism are uh, you know living in a fantasy world. Uh, it's a, it's an unreal world. Mm. Uh, the most we should uh, hope for is a society based on natural law alone, not on revelation, not on Catholic faith. Well, the obvious answer to that is, is in fact, uh, there never have been societies which have been based on natural law alone without the Catholic faith, that mm. divine revelation. So if, if anyone is, is in, a, in a fantasy world, it's the people who want uh, society to be governed by natural law alone without revelation. Uh, that's never happened. And I think there's a good reason, which we touch on in the book, why that's never happened is because human beings can't keep natural law by the mere powers of nature. That's one of the consequences of the fall. We can't keep the Ten Commandments. Um, we can't even know how to keep the Ten Commandments. We can't even know how to worship God as, as we ought uh, by reason alone. We need divine revelation for that. Uh, so you know, the natural law will only be only be kept fully in a society uh, where there is uh, divine revelation and the sources of grace are protected by the public authority. Yes, thank you. And it's, it bespeaks this American pragmatism which fails to look beyond the, the sort of dialectic of, of the next kind of Democrat versus Republican battle and see things you know, much more universally, much more in, in a much more Catholic way. And the fact that if you do not present a vision of what political communities subject to divine revelation, divine grace looks like to the unevangelized, the unbaptized, then you uh, destroy the basis of coherent religion. And, and that's, that's what we've seen in, the, uh, in, in our time. I also think there's a kind of irony to Vatican II, which is that it's, it's sort of exalted as the council of the laity. And you know, the universal call to holiness and so on is, is a good thing and perhaps was a necessary corrective to some sort of clericalism in the preconciliar church. But it seemed like there was a case of sort of bait and switch where it sort of gave with one hand and took with the other, where, as I say, the place of the laity was, uh, was affirmed and the, the mission, but then the mission was kind of taken away or it was perceived to have been taken away, going back to mm. previous uh, point you made about Dignitas Humanae. But nevertheless, if you deny integralism, if you deny the mission to conform the temporal sphere to our Lord Jesus Christ, then you deny the mission of the laity. And so they're just left to carry the cruets up in Holy Mass. I mean. Exactly. Uh, the rule of the laity, it was, the rule of all of us is to sanctify our souls, but the particular rule of the laity, qua laity, is to, is to uh, sanctify the temporal order. Uh, and you can't sanctify the temporal order uh, by excluding the giver of sanctity. Uh, as we as we say in the um, the Gloria to sort of sanctus, we say to to Christ, thou alone art the Holy One. Um, so, in a, in an attempt to uh, well to sanctify the the temporal order by conforming it to natural law alone is, is a contradiction in terms. Uh, and um, attempt to uh, simply gain freedom for my uh, religious practice, or for me to educate my children in the Catholic faith, well, that's that's a good thing. 
Uh, that's what comes first, but it's not not the not the end of the story, uh, because it's, it's, it's and this goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of the interview that society itself is is a natural reality, uh, and therefore it has duties to God. Uh, so, it's, God is the is the first cause of society, uh, and He has a right to receive worship uh, from society, and um, you know that worship is. Uh, is Catholic worship. That's what's the kind of worship which is it glorifies God in the way that he's appointed. Um, and so to to settle for anything less than that, to settle for anything less than explicitly Catholic society, um, in which uh, the, the structures of society, the laws, the uh, uh, the, um, the way in which um, uh, decisions are made, uh, is all ultimately directed by the glory of God and the salvation of souls. To, assess, to settle for anything less than that is to do an injustice to God. Is to refuse to give God the uh, the glory that is His due. Um, so, um, and as you say, once that once that is is lost sight of, or once people come come confused about about the rule of the laity, uh, then. Uh, it, New, new people come, it comes to seem as if we have to create, or as if the church, meaning by that the hierarchy, has to create uh, new jobs for them uh, you know, within the church, and as if you know, it's the perhaps having a lay person sit on a marriage tribunal or something like that is the role of the lady. Well, obviously, a lay person can sit on a marriage tribunal if he or she is you know, properly qualified, but that's that's sort of accidental as it were it's not um it's not what uh we're really talking about when we talk about the role of the laity we're talking about uh you know, conforming uh, the structures of society to the gospel and to the catholic faith yes and it seems that that any attempt to reassert the traditional church teaching on church and states in, on integralism is very much seen as a threat by the power structure, by the oligarchs who, this is the, the, very much the theme of David Wemhoff's work, who draws from the Italian Amontari Fanfani, how the oligarchs resent any kind of constraint on their individual wills and their accumulation of wealth that the church would be able to apply in a Catholic society, and so do what they can to uh, frustrate and uh, the mission of the church and corrupt Catholics in their attempts to to carry that out. And I mean, it's interesting. So your your critics caricature your propositions, your doctrine in all sorts of absurd ways, calling it sort of clerical fascism and things like that. But it struck me that a few months ago, one of your your critics on Twitter who is a sort of prominent neoconservative Catholic commentator in this country, has historically suffered from same-sex attraction. And it seems that people with that disorder and others are sort of terrified of a Christian social order. They're terrified of what it would be like because there could actually be consequences to uh, grave transgressions of the natural law. And this strikes me as why homosexuality in the hierarchy is so serious, because they don't actually want a Christian social order. Well, I can't comment on individuals, but um, it's obvious that uh, there are huge vested interests against, uh, against the restoration of Christendom. And um, certainly the uh, the fact that we have, have drifted so far away from natural law today um, means those, those vested, vested interests uh, uh, take on ever more um, uh, uh, ext extreme forms or become ever more, ever more powerful. Um, and in that kind of situation, um, Well, I think it's important to um, to preach the truth 
um, of of mercy as well as the truth of natural law because a lot of people i think in our society have very wounded consciences uh the most obvious reason is is abortion mm. it's a, a, a terrible business um now we in our in our book uh make make the point that um abortion as an offence against natural law can legitimately be retroactively um, prosecuted, as has happened at the, uh, the Nuremberg trials when um, people were convicted of offences against natural law, um, even though they'd been supposedly legal in their own jurisdictions uh, on the grounds that they ought to have known that they were contrary to natural law. And I would, I would say that would absolutely apply to, to abortionists. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, that that's an uh, important um, part of uh, of Christendom that uh, grave offences against natural law are, are are prosecuted. In the case of of uh, abortion, people who have had abortions. Well, I think that's one of the one of the great hidden causes of of resistance to the gospel of of really secret despair in many people's lives. Uh, and I think it's very important that people learn, uh, people hear that those sins are grave sins which can be forgiven by the mercy of God. And they can't be forgiven by pretending that they weren't sins. No, nothing can be forgiven like that. They can't, they can't be solved by you know, psychoanalysis or uh, you know, human means, but they can absolutely be washed away by the blood of our Lord. Once the church preaches that truth with power, then I think there will be less resistance to Christendom, uh, which is at the moment present because of, of wounded consciences. Yes, I think amongst many elements missing in the contemporary pro-life movement is a clear articulation of what we are advocating will happen if the the law was changed to reflect the natural law about the the sanctity of life and that as you say there will be consequ the full the full force of the temporal sword will apply to protect innocent life and that and, and what would you say to some traditional catholic laity who who sometimes feel sort of quite angry towards priests who won't preach the social kingship of christ perhaps as the the priests themselves enjoy a degree of worldly comfort and uh, Catholics are struggling in, in companies and corporations that are increasingly diabolical and uh, nations that are apostatizing more and more. And the fact that once a priest no longer it's clear to the laity that their mission is to conform society to the gospel, then they will almost necessarily, the logic is that they will stop sanctifying souls and sort of muscle in on the mission of the laity and start advocating things like the great reset and uh you know various kind of hoaxes that the the sort of masonic uh, power structure presents to us well the, the actual actual punishments to be uh administered to you know those kinds of grave offenses against natural law they're a matter for the the temporal power to decide so it's not a matter for uh for clergy um to uh, to decide in, in particular cases what a, is an adequate or a suitable punishment um, on the uh, on the question of uh, priests who uh, so you, you're, you're you're suggesting that the people are are frustrated because uh, frustrated when priests are not sufficiently uh, preaching the uh, or not seem to be not seeming to be sufficiently aware of the difficulties which which they have in their daily lives because of the uh, anti-christian bent of of so so many uh institutions and societies is, is that the yes that's that's question? quite right and 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 the fact that they you know if you love something it means you it follows that you have zeal for it mm -hmm. and there is you know effective rhetoric is characterized as you know by effective use of 
logos, pathos, and ethos. And there, there seems to be little of that often in sub priests, or so the criticism runs, in exhorting the laity to, to, to build Christendom. And as I say, a, a resentment that the, the priests, uh, or some priests sort of buy into various false narratives put around by the conspiracy of Antichrist, by the revolutionaries. So what, what are the false narratives that you've got in mind there? Well, for example, the, the relative virulence of the, the COVID-19 virus and the, the supposed right of the, the temporal authority to uh, prohibit people seeing their loved ones from earning a livelihood, to being coerced to receive a, an experimental mRNA mm-hmm. injection, and this being promoted by many clerics. The, the idea of anthropogenic uh, climate change and how this is a, a priority in the church, despite the fact that thousands and thousands of innocents are slaughtered by abortion each year, it, it, it looking to basically kind of cozy up to the power structure. Well, this is always a temp- temptation uh, in, an, in every age, a temptation to, uh, to please the world um, by saying the kinds of things that the world wants to hear by taking up the kinds of moral crusades that, that are acceptable in worldly terms. Um, I mean, that, that's the temptation is not new in the particular form in which it take, which it takes today is, is, is new. Um, I suppose the, the, the thing to the thing that, that we as priests need to remind ourselves of is that our, our, our area of competence is strictly limited. Uh, we, the, the fact of ordination, doesn't give us any particular competence on uh, you know, the questions of uh, you know, the virulence of a, of a virus or, uh, or you know, whether, the, whether anthropogenic global warming is going on or not. I mean, you know, we can have our own opinions about that. And they might be interesting opinions, but we've got no right to, uh, to speak of them as if they were part of the gospel because they're not. Uh, so they're not, they're not part of the, um, uh, the moral teaching that, that we that we can give as priests so that's uh, that's one thing i would say that we that we need to be aware of, of the limits of our own area of competence um and not to overstep them uh, and technical questions that require technical knowledge about medicine or um, climatology and so on that they're not part of our competence uh so secondly more specifically uh i i think that there is a need to be aware that uh, the spiritual end of man um, uh, trumps his temporal end. Uh, uh, and whether or not we're in a situation of Christendom, that's true. Uh, and so whether or not we're in a situation of Christendom, the temporal powers don't have the right to stop Catholics going to Mass uh, and receiving the sacraments. Uh, they can strongly advise that in certain cases, uh, and the bishops may decide to take their advice. But uh, I think it's good for the bishops not to give the impression of of thinking that they're obliged to take that advice, or or even that they're actually subject to the temporal power in those questions. Um, so that's that's something which I think is, has not really been talked about enough in this past year. Uh, the fact that it's the bishops uh, and, and not the temporal powers who have ultimately got the right to decide whether or not um, a Catholic is, is dispensed from Mass. Mm. Well, Father Crean, you've been incredibly generous with your time and with your insights. So uh, I'd like to just uh, end on, on one final question, if, if that's okay with you. If you'll permit me, Father Green, I would just like to read a a Twitter thread that you authored in September last year. You you tweeted this, quote, The fathers of the last great council bade us mark the signs of the times. It is an evangelical phrase used by our Lord, and it refers to recognizing the fulfillment of divinely inspired prophecy. So let us attempt to do so. The nations have apostatized from the church. 2 Thessalonians 2.3. The Jews have retaken Jerusalem, putting an end, it would seem, to the times of the Gentiles. Luke 21, 24. 
the last states to continue, however tenuously, the Roman imperial tradition, Austria-Hungary and Russia, fell a lifetime ago, though the final heir apparent to the last emperor died within the present decade, 2 Thessalonians 2.7 and Patristic Commentary. The sin of Sodom is everywhere publicly triumphant, such a sin as the angelic doctor foretold would mark the final combat, commentary on the second letter to the Thessalonians. Abortion is made a sacred right, Matthew 24, 12. Idols have been openly honoured in St. Peter's, Matthew 24, 15. Babylon Leviathan extinguishes the still lingering traditions of Christian liberty, Revelation 13, 3, and everywhere threatens the perpetual sacrifice, Daniel 9, 11. From the heaven of high authority, does a life-giving rain fall or destructive fire? Revelation 13.13. 13. I do not claim that all these prophecies have been wholly fulfilled, but those which have not seem now to trend towards their fulfillment. The needles, we might say, are all on red. Do not give way to either despair or to false complacency. Go to confession and pray the rosary. Qui persera veverit, usque in finem, hic salvus erit. He who endures to the end will be saved, end quote. Very, very stimulating, thought-provoking series of tweets there, Father Crean. If there's any, is there anything you'd like to expand on? Well, I suppose one thing that I didn't, didn't mention, which is also relevant uh, to the theme, is the, the preaching of the gospel to all nations, which I believe, I believe that all sovereign states on earth have heard uh, the preaching of the gospel at some point in their existence. So that's another, I would say, another sign of the times um, that we should bear in mind. So, well, it is not for us to, uh, to know the day or the hour, but nevertheless, our Lord told us to, to stay awake and to, to read the signs of the times. Uh, and that's recently been reaffirmed by, as I said, the last council. I don't really have anything else to add to that, except that I, uh, that um, um, sometime uh, some people are going to be living in the last times. Some people are going to be living in the times of uh, Antichrist, which uh, may not be quite the last times because uh, uh, St. Thomas at least thought that there will be a, a period after the times of Antichrist. And whoever's living in that, those times will probably think it quite unlikely that they are doing so because we're all prone to what they call normality bias. Uh, and that's what our Lord was talking about in the gospel, where he said, I think that well, he said that um, uh, people were, uh, as it was in the days of the floods, it will be in the days of the Son of Man, people were eating and drinking, uh, buying and selling, marrying and being given in marriage until the day when uh, Noah went into the ark and the flood swept them all away. So it will be in the times, in the days of the Son of Man. So there is a tendency to normality bias in all of us. And I think it's part of our, our duty as Christians to, to avoid normality bias and uh, to, to stay alert. And, and as I said in the end of that tweet, uh, go to confession to pray the rosary because we know not the day nor the hour. It's interesting. So the theory that the triumph of the Immaculate Heart as promised by Our Lady of Fatima represents the, the second coming of our Lord rather than a specific sort of Marian triumph which will precede the coming of Antichrist. So, I mean, there's obviously all sorts of various prophecies that our current time, the, the Apostia nations will terminate in a, a, a chastisement of fire. Mm -hmm. And then there will be a great triumph of the church where the whole world will convert. Is, is that a, a time frame that you think is, is sort of plausible? Or? Well, the, word, I mean, the words attributed to Our Lady at Fatima uh, speak of a period of peace. Uh, so it doesn't seem possible to identify that with... Uh, the final return of our Lord. So that's not a period of peace that they will usher in. Mm. Um, of course, when we, when we, it's a question of, of, of prophecy. We also have to be aware that what matters most to God is spiritual things, but he knows that what matters, that what influences us most are, are physical things. And therefore it's natural for God to use physical imagery to get our attention. Uh, when he is speaking about spiritual things. And we find this in the book of the apocalypse all the time. So uh, you know, we, we don't expect an actual uh, beast with uh, seven heads to be stomping about the high street uh, or with, with 10 horns that we can count. Uh, that's a physical thing which he's, he's using to get our attention. Mm. 
if there are private revelations we speak about fire from heaven well we, uh, you know we have to bear in mind that quite possibly the same thing is going on in those in those uh in those those private revelations um so so what it seems to me is that uh such private revelations as we have and um, book of the apocalypse as far as as one can can understand it it's, it's a book which is written to be understood really as it's fulfilled and not beforehand but as far as we can understand it one may reasonably hope for a, a period of of renewed uh triumph of renewed christendom for the church um uh before the end uh but that we may well have to pass through a very difficult time before we get there uh, really is that's i think all i can all i can discern of where we are thank you father green forgive me if i misrepresent your words here but on a an interview you talked about how there really is no such thing as a true atheist how the the person that sort of professes unbelief is merely rationalizing their own guilt as a result of sins they've committed I and mean, certainly the natural law is is inscribed on in our hearts if true this is an important principle that we should take forward with a work of evangelization in that atheism is not a an intellectual problem but a moral problem i've interviewed here dr e michael jones before who's talked about various sort of revolutionary efforts to destroy the faith of seminarians in in the 30s in austria and how that would involve encouraging them to view uh, pornography how it wasn't about disproving aquinas's five ways or something it was just mm -hmm. about getting them to masturbate how should that inform our the way that we deal with the sort of supposed atheism that's all around us yes i think that's um a fair representation i think it's it's saint paul's teaching in the first chapter of romans where he talks about people suppressing the truth about god um and he imply, implies uh that it's because of uh moral problems in their own lives that, that they do this um so it's not exactly that it's not that the atheist is, is lying in a simple sense uh you know about you know the way that he might somebody might lie about what their name is but that they are constantly internally uh forcing down the natural tendency of the mind to recognize the creator uh and that there are moral motivations for that uh so as far as evangelization goes yes well i think that means that that while we should continue to give proofs for the existence of god because we should evangelize the whole person including the intellect um we don't need to first convert people to theism and then try to convert them to christ but we can uh begin uh by preaching christ and uh for many people i'm sure that coming to faith in christ and coming to an explicit belief in god will be one and the same one and the same thing uh yes i mean every sin weakens the light of reason to some extent but yes uh, sexual sins are particularly prone to depress the reason and turn it away from higher things um so yes they are obviously the moral law has to be forcefully presented clearly presented um all, always as i as i said before in, in such a way as though as not to depress people but as to encourage them and that's mm -hmm. the and that's the the role that's the challenge for preachers that's why why preachers uh, rely should rely very much on the prayers of the faithful certainly we'll be praying for for your mission for your ministry for the success of this excellent uh, manual integralism manual political philosophy so thank you very much for your time uh, father cream thank you very much <laughs>